You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello and welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. I'm your host for the program, Ray Gerard, with me in studio, Mr. Bob Hennigas. Bob, welcome once again. Good to be with you, Ray. Thanks. So this is, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a program that, well, first off, let's, let's tell everybody, uh, uh, let's wish them this. Let's wish everybody grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, is that the way St. Paul would start the program if he were alive today? Well, St. Paul wrote many letters starting that way. And, of course, that's a beautiful thing to wish people grace and peace. For Paul, these weren't abstract concepts. They were spiritual realities. And so what else besides those types of things would he tell us if he were alive here today? Well, we're going we're gonna to tell you that today, as we do with all, with all of these programs. And we've got a little bit of an inside track on St. Paul. Uh, basically, the, the letters that he already wrote. Uh, those letters that he wrote before contain the things, the same things that he would tell us today here in America. The answers to life's problems do not change. They are the same now as they were then. But each week on this program, we take up a different issue, something that's going on in our society, something happening in America, which if St. Paul saw, he might uh, want to tell us something about. And so today we're going to uh, take up this particular little case that happened down in Florida. Um, father gets a, a phone call from a school one day. He's, he's got a 12-year-old daughter in school. And he gets a phone call one day. Um, you know, he might need to come down here. Why? Is the kid in trouble? Is the kid, you know, acted up? Uh, you know what? Well, it's just this little, little, little problem. Um, she just attempted to commit suicide. And this isn't really the first time. <laughs> this is the second time she's tried it. And, well, it's because of gender issues. Gender issues. Parents had no idea. The school had secretly been having meetings with this girl, trying to convince her that she was a boy. And they gave her a different name. And in front of the other students in the school, began referring to her her with that name and pronouns that matched. They were referring to her as a boy. You're a preteen. You're in a difficult time of life to begin with. You're trying to figure out, like, who you really are. You're worried about peer pressure. And now they're not even call- Now you're not even a girl. Um, and this child tried to kill herself. Wow. So the child herself didn't necessarily feel this way. This was something that this school decided for her as best we can understand. The, there's not a lot of information on this yet, but the one thing the father did say in a televised interview was that she's at home, she feels a relief, and she's happy. God bless her. I'm, man, you have to, your heart goes out to her to, that she would experience something like that, that, that anxiety is going on for her. I mean, we have enough, each of us, especially young kids that are 11, 12 years old, have enough anxiety to deal with that they don't need their authority figures adding more to it, right? It's, that's, that's just horrific for, for that to be going on for this poor kid. So I think it's a fair assumption to say it, at a minimum she was uneasy with this. Maybe there was something that gave the school some indication that this was what she wanted. But obviously, if she's trying to commit suicide not once but twice— Excuse me, shouldn't that be some kind of a red flag to somebody? Um, anyways, uh, so the question is... And wouldn't you think as a parent you ought to find out if your child attempted suicide? Well, I'd, well you'd want to know. You certainly want to know so that you can help her and do something with it. That, that the, seems almost criminal not to tell the parents that. The school apparently said, or somebody at the school said, um, that um, the parents were not informed because of their Catholic beliefs. And they figured that the parents would not agree with what the school was doing. So because the parents would not agree, they thought the parents would not agree, they decided to go behind their back and hide it from them. 
they decided to operate really in a deceptive fashion, not open and out front, and I would say not in an honest manner, but in mm-hmm. a deceptive manner, um, you know, because of their Catholic beliefs. So because you think someone's not going to agree with you, you manipulate things to do it anyway. And a child almost died. She tried hanging herself. You know what's in the best interest of that child more than the parents do. And you're going to pursue this to the point where she tries to hang herself. And that's when you finally say, okay, I'll have to tell the parents. I mean, no, I mean, twice, right? Yeah. The first time, right. the school doesn't tell them. You know, I don't know. It, it, all I know is that it, it says that she tried suicide twice. I'm not exactly sure oh my. the circumstances regarding the first attempt. Oh, my. But we do know, according to the, the parents, that the school deliberately decided to hide what they were doing from the parents. Um. And that now this child, you know, um, is relieved. She, it's described by the parents as like a situation. The situation was, they thought it was bullying. You know, this child was being browbeaten and, and bullied into doing something she did not want to do. Now, if you're trying to do things in the best interest of the child, I would think, you know, if it's all about, I mean, transgenderism is all about letting people decide for themselves, their own gender. Well, if that's true, why don't you listen to the child? If she's uneasy about this, back off. Why carry it to the point that the... So, anyways, that's what happened. And the fact is, it's not an isolated incident. There are similar uh, stories around the country of the same sort of thing happening. So, this all raises the question, well, <laughs> What does Catholic teaching have to say about this? What does St. Paul have to say about this? So we've got a, we've got a little, we've got some words of St. Paul that we think uh, would apply because they do express uh, some interesting and very illuminating truths. And St. Paul wrote that a body is one, though it has many parts, and all of the parts of the body, though many, are one body. If a foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. But God has so constructed the body so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. Now, St. Paul's not done yet. Now, you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. For in one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Now, I mean, what is St. Paul talking about? He's just, on the surface of it, it just seems like all he's really talking about is the fact that, well, just like you could take take the human body as an analogy and just simply say, well, all these parts work together, just like a human body or a car or anything else that has multiple parts and they work together. Well, you can use that by analogy to to describe the larger body of Christ, all of humanity being connected through Christ, which is a deep concept in and of itself. But there's more to it than that. St. Paul sees the body, the human person, as a single entity. That idea is what is under attack these days. Plato had this concept, to go back to the famous Greek philosopher, Plato had this concept that the spirit, he, they recognized even the Greeks in those days, that you know there's, there's an inner... Uh, rational, con- there's an inner conscience, inner thinking piece of every human person, and we're not just flesh and blood, and that's all there is. But there's something that you know uh, that makes us who we are. There's, there's some there's something you know. There, there's our mind, there's our our soul, if you will. But there's some there's some persona that we each have, and uh, and that 
you know, you could call that the person's inner spirit. And that spirit is not connected uh, intimately or completely with the body. They're, they're two separate things and that the spiritual half is, in a certain sense, different, higher than the physical half. Uh, flash forward about 15th, 16th centuries to the early uh, mid-1600s in France, René Descartes had uh, the same thing. He said, I think, therefore I am, the famous cogito ergo sum argument. And um, from that he formulated what is known as Cartesian dualism, which is this idea, again, that, you know, uh, a person is who he is because he thinks and that the, the thinking part is separate from the physical part. And this is really what is behind transgenderism. Your physical body does not define you. You may be born with certain sexual parts, but if in your mind you feel that those parts are not consistent with your mental reality, then those parts don't matter. Didn't Plato even go so far as to say, almost infer, that the spirit, this this spirit that we each have, is good, more in control, better, and that the body was evil. Yeah. It was the body that actually well, caused a, the evil, and, and you had to, with your spirit, take control of that. Wasn't that part of his theory? There's a, there's a heretical movement I think the church did battle with in the past that is along the lines of, of what you're talking about, Bob. But it's this, but the same idea is now alive today. This is the idea that, um, you know, because you, you try to make sense of what's happening in these schools, why are they doing this? Why do they? Why do some people seem to feel this is so important that they let nothing stand in their way, that they don't let parents stand in their way, they don't consult the parents? They don't. Why? You know, why is this so important? Well, it's a view of life. It's a view of existence. It's a view of all reality. And so, you know. If someone has a, a completely different view of reality, well, you can't talk to that person. I mean, this is this is what we're dealing with. You have to get to the roots of this. You have to get to the ideas behind what's going on if you're going to be able to deal with it or respond to it or try to make some kind of a sense out of it so that you can talk to other people about it. I mean, we as Catholics always have this, uh, this, this challenge in, in front of us. You know, society has viewed Catholics... Uh, with, you know, certain suspicions uh, throughout history. Uh, certainly in the early years of, of this country, Catholics were viewed that way by a lot of people. And so, you know, we get faced with challenges. Well, your Catholic faith um, is bigoted against, you know, same-sex people. Your Catholic faith is, is guilty of this, is guilty of that. So how do we respond? How do we explain ourselves? Especially if the Catholic faith contains the truth. If we have the real truth, it's important for us to be able to explain it in contrast to other people's ideas. We have to understand those other ideas if we're going to be able to explain ours and understand the differences. And that's, that's more than just a nice thing to do. It's an, actually an obligation. If we have the truth, if we have the truth, then it is really important for us to help other people with that truth. So um, that's one question that we, we, we try to deal with here on this program is, do we have the truth? We don't take anything for granted. We'll hold things up to different viewpoints and see which one is correct. Funny thing about it, uh, more often than not, actually <laughs> all the time, the truths we find in St. Paul uh, do work. They just do. Because they're, because. God is real, and his views, I mean, there's a reason why he's been read for thousands of years. You know, what he says stands the test of time. It works. It's connected with God. It's consistent, you know, with God. There is a God. It's consistent with God. You know, and people go down these other paths, and they try these different things, and then they fade, but the church remains, and that's the way it has been, and that's the way it is always going to be, simply because there is truth in this. And if you think perhaps in this one particular case, that's not so, and that transgenderism does uh, hold a different truth, a better truth, well, then we're going to challenge you to listen to the rest of this program because we're going to put that under the microscope. 
Well, Ray, I think for each of us, one of the one of the concerns people might have, Catholic might have, is I'm not informed well enough. I don't have all the data. I don't have all the information. So I'm a little afraid to go out and talk about this. And to me, the reality is that none of us are capable of doing that. That's not what it's about. It's about letting people know how much God loves us, that each of us is flawed in many different ways, but trying to understand what it is God desires for us. And God desires for us to be with him, to live by his principles. And it is through discussion or conversation and talking with people that you begin to understand truly what God represents, his love, his wonder, and not to be fearful. Not one of us can hold an argument and argue properly what God is telling us. What we have to do is listen, listen to God, listen to the scriptures, listen to the tradition of the Catholic Church, and truly understand and absorb that and be willing to go out and talk with people about these very important issues and and not be afraid. It's almost as if many of us are fearful. We don't want to let other people know what our faith is. We somehow are afraid of it. We can't defend it. We're not bright enough, so I'm just going to leave it alone, and I'm going to let other people toss rocks at us and let that go on. And you don't want to fight back. I think that's also wrong. I think the conversation is to have a loving conversation with what our ideals are and let that come across. I came across this article by a woman writing on a a site called lifeteen.com, and it sounds as if she's a young woman, and it sounds as if um, she's perhaps a life teen counselor. But when I read it, I uh, am preparing for this program, I felt that it really expressed what I was thinking. And she says... Any time, and she's going to write. She's writing about her, the title of her article: "What the Catholic Church Wants the Transgender Community to Know." And she starts this way: "Any time I write about topics like this, I get nervous. I get a pit in my stomach, and I worry that whoever whoever reads it won't fully understand what I'm trying to say, and that it comes from the best part of my heart." She continues. It comes from a place in my heart that only knows care and concern and love. It's the part that wants to welcome everyone with open arms. The part where my deepest desire is that no one would ever be turned away from a pew in a church. I wish that no one would be looked looked upon scornfully, scornfully or judged for the outside appearance with no regard for what matters most, who they are. And you can just feel uh, the sincerity in these in these words. You know, she says later on in this piece, if you're a teenager who experiences that your body doesn't feel like your own and that you weren't meant to be the sex indicated by your body, I totally understand how it can feel like the Catholic Church isn't the place for you. You know, I, I also happen to come across a bunch of uh, Twitter entries in preparing for this program and There are a lot of people for whom these are really very personal, hurtful, trying, challenging uh, issues. They they have confusion about their gender, and it's um, it 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 tears at them, and you can just really sympathize with them. And so, first and foremost, before anything else is said, you know, people who defend the Catholic faith say, as you just did, Bob, and should say, that, you know, we want everybody to feel like, number one, they are not judged, and they are accepted, and they are loved. And that's not just a trite kind of thing to say. People who really believe in the love of God, if you've ever really experienced it, sensed it, come to know it, uh, boy, oh, boy. I mean, and you know, if you've ever sensed his, his real forgiveness for you, his unchanging, undying love for you, uh, sometimes that's hard to believe. For, I mean, for me, yeah, for you, God, the, the maker of the universe, for you. Um, you know, you can't, you know, if you're true to yourself, judge other people, put down other people. Does it happen lots of times? Well, of course it does. It wouldn't be human if we didn't fail. But if you're going to be true, 
to the Church of Christ and the man who, I mean, what he did out of love, what he suffered out of love, I mean, if he could go through that, the least we can do, if we're going to be true to that, is not to try to, not to hurt other people when we don't have, you know, not to hurt other people. So I was going to say when you don't have to, but you never have to uh, hurt other people. So anyways, um, you know, but, um, you know, you know, the, the fact is that a lot of people, like what you said before, Bob, was that, you know, uh, a lot of people have this problem. Well, why was I born this way? And that's a common complaint about the Catholic Church. Well, it's like, well, you think that this God is perfect and you think that God never makes mistakes. But he made me in a confused state. So he created this confused person that I am. So, you know, he's either not perfect or he's either not loving or there's something wrong here. And the fact of the matter is that he is perfect and he is loving. We all have challenges of one sort or another. And as you said before, Bob, the only real job we have in this life is to find our way to him, to actually to go home, to go back to where we came from. And in the process of dealing with the challenges or sufferings or the turmoil that we experience in this life, to then still go home to him and still hold him of primary importance, no matter what else you may have as a problem, simply means that you love him. You give him glory by doing that. We can't give God anything. He doesn't need anything. But if we put up with whatever we have to put up with and still thank him and love him, that's only because of how great he is and how, we, how much we understand that we owe everything to him and how great he is. And that gives him glory to everybody who sees that. So, you know, um, that's, I think that's, that's the starting point for, you know, for all of this. But the fact is that the transgender ideas that you can decide who you are in contrast to your physical body has not only some real issues, but some real fallacies to it. Um, as a title for this program, we would, uh, we would say it should be dividing the body. We started with a reading from St. Paul where he talks about the body being one. So what do we mean when we talk about dividing the body? And why, is, why does transgenderism um, act like something that divides the body? What body and what kind of division does it, does it cause? Well, it occurs on three levels. Three levels. It separates us from God. It separates us from other people, whether that be our parents, our potential spouses, society in general. It separates us from other people. And it separates us from our own self. It doesn't just separate us on one level. It does it on all three. So it is... It is um, and, and there's a reason why that is. And the reason is it's based on a false premise. And it's the one we've already talked about. It's this idea that your mind can be separated from the body. The Catholic Church still maintains that the body and the spirit are one. Now, why would you think that? Because the Catholic Church maintains we have a soul. Uh, our body, you know, will, will pass away from dust to dust. You know, you, you're going to return to dust. Your body's going to end up to dust. Why would the Catholic Church maintain that the human body is one with your soul? Well, there's a, there's a couple of reasons behind that. Um, number one, we have uh, the truth from Christ himself who died and was seen with his resurrected body. We can also go to this little, little known guy. He, uh, he spent a little time thinking, writing about stuff, just, you know, odd kind of things. His name was St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, regarded as probably the best theological writer uh, in human history. Anyways, so um, he said, it is one of the same man who is conscious both that he understands and that he senses. But one cannot sense without a body, therefore the body must be some part of a man. Think about it this way. 
Next time you read a magazine article, a book, anything like that, you will see, your eyes will see the words on the page or on the screen. And at the same time, you understand those words. You see with the eyes, and then you understand with your inner being, your mind. You know, you understand. Um, now, everybody, you know, people can, everybody has a brain. Everybody has, you know, certain physiological, biological components of a brain. But we understand different things from the things that we read. We interpret it through our own lens. We have our own individual persona. We see with the eyes, and we understand with who we are. Um, so both of those things happen simultaneously, and one cannot happen without the other. It's a very simple kind of way of looking at it, but it's just one indication that the body and the soul are one. Our consciousness and our, our physical body, it is one. And the interesting thing is, as I... As I read that, I was also thinking, well, you know, the same concept applies to Christ. We talk about the Eucharist as the body, blood, soul, and divinity. The body, the blood, okay, your physical body. Then it's your soul, same as every human person. But your divinity, well, okay, that's not the same as every human person, so Christ is a little different there. But it's the same concept. If you can have divinity and a soul and a physical being all combined, they form a single whole, a unified whole. What do we think of, of Christ? If God became man, would we then say, well, he left the God part up in heaven? It, I mean, how do you cut up a person? You know, how can you how can you literally cut up a person? I mean, can you cut off a hand and say, okay, it doesn't belong to the body? Well, no, now you have a body without a hand. I mean, there, there's, there's a beauty, there's a simplicity, and just a, uh, just, just, just a unconscious righteousness to this idea that there's unity as opposed to disunity. Just on a very basic level, it seems like, yeah, that makes more sense. You know, Ray, if you if you think through, or if I do, I, I try to think through the conversation we're having. And Jesus is a great example. He always is. But we actually saw, people saw, not me. Not I wasn't around that long ago. I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. Yeah. We, uh, the disciples saw his restored body and actually saw that. And... We believe that this will happen for us. But I guess the point I want to make is our existing body, me sitting here right now, I have both a flawed body and I have a flawed mind and I have a flawed soul. But what we saw in Jesus was the perfection after the rising. Before, his body was frail like anyone else. It could be crucified and killed. It had these things that could happen to it. And yet, all of that was put back together, and his body after resurrection was beautiful and perfect and could not be harmed. And that's where we're headed. Not only our body to be transformed, but our mind and our soul to be transformed. And that's what we need to be with God, because he is perfect. And I think we somehow try to think or figure that we should be perfect now. Some people may make that assumption. In fact, I get a kick out of it. People are hearing that I'm going to be a deacon, and they ask me a question about the Scriptures or about God. And I say, I don't know. Yeah. And they said, that's not possible. You're going to be a deacon. You should know everything. Right. And I always want to make the comment, no, I am flawed. I am missing information. I'm missing capability. I am shy of what I should be. You're not an isolated single entity. <laughs> you can rely, I mean, you can refer to the catechism. You can refer to other thinkers, other scholars in the church, other people who know the scripture. We operate we operate best when we operate with other with, people. Absolutely, around, surrounded by other people to understand this, to talk with people. And I just don't think anyone should have the feeling that they have to be depended on to 
shoulder the load and carry all of this. In fact, what St. Paul is telling us is that we together, if we can show people the love that Jesus has, that the Catholic Church has, even though we are mistake-prone, even though we make mistakes, we together can help people understand that we can make it through gender dysfunction and all the other things that we suffer from. If you believe, if you show kindness, if you are willing to love, not only people with whom you disagree, but people who like hurt you, if you're willing to love them, then you demonstrate your belief that we're all one. We are all together. St. Paul says, you know, we, these parts of the body have all the same concern for one another. Elsewhere in that same writing, he says, you know, if one part of the body of Christ, the church, the people in the church, if one part suffers, then we all suffer. We feel that pain. We feel the pain of that other person. If we, as you say, Bob, um, have that kind of mindset, we, if we demonstrate love to somebody who is even, not only just who we disagree with, but who has hurt us, that shows them something. And that affects people because, and the reason why it affects people is because it triggers something maybe in the back of their mind. It, you know, we are all one. And we all, and we, and don't we all want to believe that we're all one? And most of the time we operate like we're not. But when somebody goes outside the norm and shows that they do, that they follow the example of Christ, I and mean, that was his example, to love those who don't love you, then, you know, uh, then you trigger all of that. Um, we talk about, you know, triggered, triggers in this life. How about using love as a trigger? Anyways, um, but this, you know, this, um, the idea starts with, the, the problem with this starts with, there's a separation from God in all of this. The idea that we can decide, I was, you know, I'm born a boy, but I feel like a woman, so I'm going to be, from now on, I am a woman. Well, you know, you still have, you know, the physical components of a, of a man, even though you say otherwise, as if, as if I can say something and then it's reality. I can say I'm a woman, and boom, that becomes reality. Well, that's what God did in Genesis, and we're not God. Um, so it's like trying to be like God, but there's a there's and there's a and, and the the thing is, there's a pride involved in this. There is a refusal to acknowledge that you were born with certain physical components because God wanted you that way. God didn't make a mistake. God wanted you that way. If you say, no, that's wrong, you're saying, I get to decide more than the person, the being that created me, that gave me life. You're denying, in a way, that there is a God that gave you life. I mean, it's it really is nothing less than a denial of God. If you believe that there's a God, if you believe that your life came from God, and you know you were born with in a certain physical, with a certain physical structure, then you you can't split the connection between that physical structure you were born with and the God who gave you life. So if you do insist that that's possible anyway, you are, in some measure, denying denying God. There's that pride in that that we can decide this for ourselves. Now there are people going to say, well, but that's just that's just cruel. How about these people that have these difficult feelings and, you know, they don't feel like the, you know, the sex, the gender they were born with? You know, what, how about those, what about those people? Are you going to tell them that, you know, I don't care what you feel. You're either a man or a woman. Like it or not, that's just how you are, so just get used to it. So, and people say, well, you know, that's just, you know, that that's just cruel. That's just, and... Obviously, the thing is that for those people who feel that way, you know, then there's, you know, there, there's a lot that can be, there's a lot that can be, that can be included in the response to that. Part of it is psychological um, treatment because a lot of these problems are psychological. Now, this is controversial and a lot of people won't agree with this, but a lot of it is psychological and there's a lot of science to back that up, some states have taken to the, uh, I think New Jersey, Massachusetts, and California 
have taken it to the level where they have passed laws that make it illegal, Canada too, I believe, make it illegal for psychiatrists to provide treatment for people with gender dysphoria. If they believe, if they feel that they're a different gender, that's true. That's just the way it is. There's a, and you have to acknowledge that. And you can't, you can't suggest to them that it's a psychological problem. You can't suggest to them that treatment could help. You have to just accept what they say as reality. I feel this way, so then you are that way. That becomes the new reality. There's a professor named uh, McHugh at John Hopkins University. John Hopkins University is an interesting place simply because they're the first ones to perform transgender surgery here in the United States. There's a famous case back in the 1960s. They did a transgender operation on one of two twins to prove the idea that if someone grew up being told, if someone was born physically a boy, but they grew up as a girl, being told they were a girl, and they learned to live that way, it would prove that your gender is just a function of what you think and what other people tell you you are, uh, what social norms are, are foisted upon you. You would just, you know, uh, you, 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 would, uh, you know, you would coordinate yourself with that. And so that would prove the theory that this is all in your mind. Well, the problem was that both of the boys, well, the one boy on which this operation was performed, and he was like two years old. He was too young to even remember. He had problems, problems, problems. By the time he was 15, 16, they finally admitted to him what they had done. His parents admitted to them what they, what he, what they had done. Can you imagine? Well, he couldn't handle it. He committed suicide. This little girl that we started this program about tried to commit suicide. Well, if the lesson had been taken to heart from this experiment that was done to this kid back in the 1960s, this little girl wouldn't have had to undergo what she went through. This boy committed suicide uh, in his 30s. Uh, he struggled with it, struggled with it, struggled with it, and eventually just said, I don't want to live anymore. Well, that's not the end of the story. So his twin brother, who was born a boy, raised a boy, never had any kind of surgery done to him, but saw what was happening to his brother because he was a twin. And because, I guess, to some extent, they were, you know, like St. Paul says, hey, we're parts of the one body. You feel the other's pain. Um, he couldn't handle it either. The idea that, what, your parents had done this to you? I don't know what was, you know, what kind of parents, you know, if, if you feel like uh, your parents aren't, uh, you know, why would they have done this to you? How much did they... How much could they have loved you if you had done this to you? How much did they love me? I don't know what was going through this kid's head. Or I but, could have been the one, right? What, one of the thoughts happened, would have, hey, they, it could have been me. Have they been flipped me. a coin, and I ended up on the heads. All of, yeah, who, all of that, all of that, sure. And he committed suicide yeah. in his 30s, both dead. So the theory that had been proven now is disproven. And this little girl in Florida disproves it again. Um, the people that have gender dysphoria, it's a real thing. For this boy who was two, how would you even know that this person would have felt like a girl? They experimented on this kid in the 1960s. This little girl, did she give enough indications that she was really a boy, that the school did this to her? So are we now as a society doing this to people who don't have real gender dysphoria? Um, if that's the case, then, you know, what are, what are we doing? But, you know, people say, well, this business about, you know, uh, God making people this way, it's just cruel, it's not right. And you know, the first question is, well, do you believe in a God? Then we can start talking about, you know, what, what we can ascribe to God. Uh, but the first question is, do you believe in a God? And that's actually a good conversation to begin to have with people. Is there a God? Because there is a wealth, there's a wealth of things that you can go into, so much evidence for the existence of God. But, you know, the first thing this does, this, this idea um, that um, there is not a God who created us and that we get to decide, even contrary to, you know, maybe how God created us, well, that on a level separates us from God. There's, an, there's a part of this that 
includes a separation from this idea of God. There are people, of course, who believe they're good Catholics and they believe in transgenderism and so on and so forth. And there are transgender people that love the Catholic faith and want to uh, and want to be part of the Catholic Church. All well and good. All well and good. But there is an element to the philosophy behind transgenderism that if it's accepted. If the theory, if the thinking behind transgenderism is accepted on a general level, there is there's an effect. There will be an effect. How much uh, is is debatable, but there will be an effect of separating people from God. That's just part of it because you can't get around this fact that we're trying to play God. If you decide, well, no, I'm I'm going to you know I'm going I get to decide you know what I am. Well, I think every one of us, Ray, in one way or another, desires something that God is telling us no, and we fight that. Oh, happens we, all the time. Oh, we e- each one of us does that, right? And and it's a it's a hard battle. Uh, I think each one of us has that, and certainly someone that has gender dysphoria, that's a pretty tough, very tough task to to try to handle. But each one of us does that has those difficulties, and, and what God is saying, what I think we as a Catholic Church are, are saying, is that what we really want to do is begin to understand that God is not asking us, God is not telling us what we have to do. God is inviting us to what we should do, which is to follow him. There will be lots of choices in our life to do lots of things, and God is asking us, Not telling us, but asking us to come have a relationship with him and be with him. And you get to choose that. You get that that right, that option. And we as Catholics are not telling anyone. What we're doing is inviting people to a level with God, a higher level with God in heaven and the rest of eternity with God by giving up what we want as human beings that we desire greatly as human beings to give up to be with God. And, you know, for myself as a deacon that's going to be, I hopefully, hopefully I'm still in play, right, to, to be ordained here in a couple months. I don't know. I, they, they asked me for a character reference. There you go. I, I, I could be in trouble. I don't trouble. think it's going to work for you. I, could be in trouble. But they're asking me as a single male to never have a relationship, a sexual relationship with a woman. That's one of the things that they request of me. And, and I am more than happy to agree to. Because if that's what God is asking me, to be a deacon, that's what I am willing to do. And I love God so much that I could give that up, that I could accept not having that relationship. And that's not something that I ever thought I'd say or desire or be willing to do, but it is something I desire to give up for God. Not what I want, but what God wants. And I am happy and I would love and do love to give that up for him, for my Lord and Savior. That's what God is asking each one of us. What is it that we want that we are okay to give up to be with that in that relationship with God? The desires that we have, and let go of those and follow him, whatever it may be that, that we're called. I think that's a tough thing for most people to understand. We all think we get to decide everything. We're independent people. We get to decide everything. And what we get to do is we do. We get to decide whether we want to be with God or not. And that's a tough choice. And that's what's being asked here. That's to trust God that he truly gave you a gender when you were born and to trust him with that as opposed to taking it away from a 12-year-old girl. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that happens. All, what you're saying, Bob, is, is absolutely, absolutely true. That happens all the time. We all have these desires of things that we want to do. And when they're against what God wants, then more often than not, if not all the time, we end up hurting ourselves or hurting other people. God only wants, you know, what's best. And sometimes we want something different. You know, uh, there's, um, to go into the science of it, uh, there was a couple of studies that were done. Uh, one at Vanderbilt University, another at London's uh, Portman Clinic, about people who had transgender feelings. And they tracked these people, uh, these people who did not have medical or surgical treatment in response to these transgender feelings. 
And they found that at certain different, you know, certain points in time, 70 to 80 percent of them spontaneously lost those feelings. Uh, about 25 percent did have persisting, persisting feelings, um, which, of course, differentiates those people. Uh, and those are the people that would have true gender dysphoria. But 70 to 80 percent. It's a fleeting thing. It comes for and 70 goes. to 80 yeah. percent, not for all, but for yeah. 70, in a, you know, in excess of 70 percent of the people. Um, in 2011, there was a study done at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. It was a long-term study. They tracked people for 30 years, 324 people. Um, and these are people who did receive medical treatment. They had, same, they had sex reassignment surgery. The study revealed that beginning about 10 years after having the surgery, they began to experience increasing mental difficulties, and their suicide mortality rose about 20-fold above the non-gender, uh, excuse me, the non-transgender population. Um, this high, it's a high suicide rate. You've got the story with the girl. She attempted this. The Rhymers, you know, they succeeded in doing it. Why is suicide something that happens to people who undergo this? Why do they want no longer to live? If there is something right about this, if there is truth in this, if it's good, if it's, if it's the way it ought to be, then why do people not want to live anymore? It's got to cause you pause. It's got to cause us pause. Um, so that's, you know, another thing that was pointed out is, for example, suppose that there's somebody that has anorexia. The physical reality is that they're thin. That's the physical reality. On the other hand, they still believe they're overweight and they want to lose more weight. They're already thin, but they want to lose more weight to the point where they're you to physically hurt themselves, almost starve to death, if not really starve to death. What do you do with people who have anorexia? Do you deprive them of food? Do you, ad- do you admit you're right? Your perception of reality is correct? Is that how we treat those people? Um, what about the transabled? There are people who believe they should be disabled. There is, there's a story... It's an article written in Canada. There's a guy cut off his arm with a power tool. He wanted. He was not disabled. He wanted to live. He, he, he didn't feel comfortable with a fully functioning body. Wanted to be disabled. A story of a woman who was perfectly healthy in her legs, but she persists in using leg braces and a, and a wheelchair because she doesn't feel comfortable without them. There's a story from Scotland in the 1990s where two people had their legs amputated from, by a doctor because that's the way they felt. They felt they should be disabled. Science doesn't fully understand this yet. They think there's some evidence that it points to a neurological problem, that the neurological mapping in the body has some issue to it. But it just goes to show that the way you feel about something might not measure up to reality. Now, for the the 25% of the people we talked about earlier who have true gender dysphoria, well, that's that's different. But for 70 to 80% of the people, the reality is different from the way they think about it. And they then think about, they can think about it differently if they're given time. Um, you know, psychology as an industry is based on the idea that the way we think about things might be wrong and that psychologists exist, the whole practice of psychology exists to help us think better. If that wasn't the case, there'd be no room for psychology, period. So to say a person thinks you know, his, his physical reality should be different than the actual physical reality is really against psychology. I mean, if you accept that, if you expect the principle, if you accept the principle behind that, 
we're denying psychology, the need for psychology, the, the basis for psychology as a whole. If everything we think then is our reality, there is no room for psychology. It, it, this is contra the science behind the whole practice of psychology. You get an idea here that this might not be uh, aligned with the truth. If the transgender philosophy was aligned with the truth, we wouldn't have these problems. You wouldn't have the high suicide rate. You wouldn't have these other cases where this doesn't add up. You know, you wouldn't think, we would think if, so, if someone says, well, I'm transabled and cut off my arm and we lop off some perfectly good, you know, arm or leg, we might think that's cruel. Well, why not if you lop off, you know, some some parts of, some private parts of a person's body, why is it okay to lop those off? Um, there's a trans, it's a famous recent case of a transracial person. Uh, she uh, was the head of the NAACP in Seattle, I believe. And then it was found out that she had two white parents. Well, she said, I feel black. Well, the transgender people wouldn't, don't accept that. There was a flurries of articles, after the story came out, there were flurries of articles that came out saying, no, 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 that, that's different. You can't, you know, you can't say you feel like you're black because that diminishes the life experiences, the, you know, the actual sufferings that black people undergo. But of course, if she identifies as black, if she was thought by many to be black, she took, you know, skin tanning type things and such, and she was able to fool people to thinking she was black, well, I'm sure she could face discrimination like any other black person. Why, why not? You know, so these are the, you know, basically she was denying her physical reality. Her physical reality was she was a white person, but she thought, she felt, in her mind, she felt black. But that doesn't, that's not accepted. So transracial people aren't accepted. Transabled people aren't accepted by the transgender community. But what's not true for them is true for the transgender. Intellectually, there's an inconsistency with this. Either what we think is accorded the status of reality or it's not. How can, it, how can that be true in some cases and not in others? So the, you know, the... And there's, we haven't even gotten to, uh, and I guess maybe we'll continue this the next time, but we haven't even gotten to um, a lot of the other topics that we were going to get into, how this separates us from ourselves, how it separates us from other people. We've touched on it in some ways, but, uh, but we just don't have the, the time uh, to continue this right now. Um, that's, that's always a problem. We're not enough time. But anyways, um, you know, as, as a Catholic, it is important to understand that what's involved in this is a splitting of the person, um, you know, the, 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 their body from their soul, their body from their physical body from what they think. And the reality is that our mind and our soul and our body, they, const- they are unified. There is a unity. There's a unity inside us, our various, the various pieces that comprise us, there is an order, there's a unity. Um, and, and there's a unity between us and other people, and there's a unity between us and God. That just makes more sense. And, uh, and we'll uh, continue this discussion on the next program, but that's, uh, that's as far as uh, we can manage today. We hope that you found this provocative, insightful, interesting. And uh, we hope you'll join us again. Uh, But until next time, we're going to leave you with a prayer. And as we always do, we ask uh, our deacon-to-be, Mr. Bob Hennigas, to lead us in that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us, to allow us to listen to you, to listen to your word, to listen to the scripture that we have, to listen to your prophets, and just listen to you. Sometimes we're dazed and confused. We don't know where to turn. We don't know what to do. We don't understand. Allow us always to know that you do. You know. And if we could just open our minds and our heart and our soul to you and what you desire, 
we would be so much better off. We could be in communion with you. Allow us to always realize that we are mistake-prone people, both in our heart and in our mind and in our soul. Allow us truly to just trust you, that you will take us to the right place. You will give us the right thoughts. You will lead us in the right way. And allow us always to love you and trust in you and follow what your son, Jesus Christ, taught us. And it is in his name, Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, that we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Until next time, God bless. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.